sort of the personal side of it, how you became interested in DMT and its effects and its research. Yeah, well, I've had a long-standing interest in, in DMT. Uh, it's an extremely fascinating molecule. I've, I've spent my entire career studying psychedelic substances, but DMT of all substances is probably the most fascinating because it's naturally occurring in nature. It's found widely in probably all plants and many animals, including humans. And so it's, it's a natural psychedelic that we produce in our own body, which is also happens to be one of the strongest psychedelics that we know of. And the, the, um, but it doesn't, we don't have the effects of it. The stuff that's in our body does not, we're not uh, talking with aliens, things of that sort, uh, unless we ingest a greater amount of it, right? Well, so the theory goes. I mean, certainly yeah. if you have a DMT experience, it can be profoundly life-changing, but there is a theory that spontaneous experiences of a, perhaps a mystical nature, like uh, alien abduction experiences or near-death experiences could involve DMT that's actually produced in the body. So DMT might be able to explain all kinds of uh, weird and wonderful spontaneous experiences that people have. Well, uh, the spirit mo molecule is the title that's been given to it. There was a book that had that in the title some years ago. Until now, it's been sort of the definitive reference book for people interested in it. And, and now you've, you've sort of sampled opinions of thinkers and researchers and experiencers from all over the world in this book. Uh, how did you pick the, the people that, that are contributed to your book and, and what did you set out to do with it? Well, this is actually the second uh, of two books actually. So this continues with our search to find great thinkers around the world that are expert in, in something to do with entity encounters, experiencing experiences of encountering some kind of discarnate other or sentient being. And so they come from a variety of different fields, everything from neuropsychopharmacology to anthropology to religious studies and cultural historians and so on. So we, we think we've pulled the greatest minds across these two books, but really discussing what we think we know about DMT entities. Uh, I know Dennis McKenna, I've interviewed him a couple of times. He's in the book. Jeff Kripal is, is in the book and they're, they're deep and uh, deep thinkers on these kind of topics. Uh, but I also saw a guy named uh, Winkleman, who sort of was the fly in the ointment, as he put it. Um, and he makes the very obvious point that can we trust our senses? You take in a powerful chemical, a, a psychoactive substance like this, uh, that does not necessarily mean that you're really encountering aliens or spiritual beings of that sort. Why don't you uh, cap encapsulize sort of that point of view that is included in your book? Yeah, absolutely. So we have a, a broad range of opinions. And of course, we, we should first and foremost consider that these are just aberrant, but if not natural brain processes, uh, you know, that being perturbed by ingestion of some kind of psychedelic agent, which is perhaps acting on normal brain regions to give you the experience of encountering some kind of other being, albeit that those experiences seem extremely real. So that should be our first port of call in, in, in trying to explain these experiences. Um, I guess where the line is drawn with those kinds of explanations is, for one thing, these experiences are so profound that people feel they are more real than this reality, that they have the, the propensity to convert even half of all atheists who have these experiences into non-atheists within the space of 10 minutes, and that some of these experiences are are, are so bizarre and yet occur so frequently, um, we'd have to go to some pretty extreme lengths to try and explain them in terms of normal brain processes. Although we can do, uh, but we just don't know enough about brain and consciousness as yet to, to give it a full explanation. That nickname, the spirit molecule that's been around for so long, uh, could you describe why people would call it that way and, and discuss for us the range of experiences that people have had? I've known people who have done this multiple times. They've encountered, they say they encounter entities of some sort and have had conversations with them. And some of them will have a, another experience when they take the same thing and they go back and continue the conversation with these same beings they encounter. It, it's, it's, it's profound. It has profound effects on the people who've, who've taken it. Very much so. I mean, life-changing effects in, in many cases, uh, like I say, they can, totally shift a person's metaphysical dial from being an atheist to a non-atheist. And of course, these encounter experiences are, are deeply compelling. You seem to be in the presence most often with some kind of sentient being, some kind of other, usually 
one that is much more intelligent, perhaps even omniscient in, in some people's experiences, even, you know, perhaps getting into kind of godlike qualities. At least that's how it, you experience it. That's how it feels. And of course, people do have conversations with them. They sometimes get some insights or revelations. They perhaps understand some deeply profound and obscure theological or cosmological kind of positions suddenly. And yet it's very difficult to bring about that information necessarily and communicate it. So the interesting thing about the name, the spirit molecule, is it, it contains this paradox or contradiction. You know, a, a, a molecule is something very much from the material world, and, and that's what it is. It's just a chemical dimethyltryptamine. But at the same time, it gives people these extremely spiritual experiences, perhaps, you know, like near-death experiences. And so it is both spirit and matter. You know, it's like a spirit molecule. And I think that that name kind of captures something really very curious about the nature of DMT and DMT entity encounters. As the knowledge of DMT spreads through books like yours, people are tempted to try it. You know, it's, it's a natural human reaction. They're tempted to try it. And now there is ayahuasca and DMT tourism in Central and South America. People go down, they come back, they say they have profound experiences, change their lives. There are places that are where there's therapy for people with PTSD. Uh, um, that are, are very popular. And again, a, a lot of claims are made, very positive claims, but there's risk in that, I would think. This is a powerful substance and it's not really for everyone, or, or would you say it, it could be? Uh, no, I happen to agree. I, I don't think these extremely kind of worldview shattering psychedelics are, are necessary for everybody. I don't, you know, I think some people may not well be prepared for them. Uh, and and it, is, it can be a bit of a one-way street. You've had that experience, you can't unhave the experience. And in most circumstances, particularly in the clinical context where they're given in controlled settings with a lot of preparation and a therapist there to guide you through it and help you integrate the experience, they're often very positive, nearly always positive. Occasionally people may have challenging experiences, uh, but very, very rarely do people regret having these psychedelic experiences in, in clinical uh, settings. Uh, and they do have potentially massive benefits in helping people deal with all manner of psychological problems like depression and anxiety and so on. But they're certainly not for everybody and uh, they, they should be taken in, in the right context if they are to be taken at all. Yeah, I, I read about a couple of weeks ago about these places in Mexico, tourist destinations where out behind the bar, you can go and lick a psychedelic toad. And um, it seems like it's it's kind of a reckless the thing to do while you're on vacation and you're drinking and enjoying yourself. Hey, let's go some, try some psychedelic toad. And I would think the same thing would be true with the increasing popularity of these ayahuasca retreats where, you know, some of them are overseen by professionals, experienced people who know what they're doing and some really not. You know, it, it, it does raise some possibilities, some really negative consequences. Yeah, absolutely. It can be somewhat of a, the Wild West in, in the world of, of psychedelic retreat centers. And of course, I'll just add extra caution about the recklessness of, of licking, licking toads, especially psychoactive ones, because actually that's quite poisonous uh, and dangerous thing to do uh, on a, just a purely physiological, toxic, chemical level. Uh, actually, the, the venom has to be extracted from the toad and, and then smoked. If anybody is going to do it, don't go around licking toads and you know, certainly be very careful about smoking. Uh, but it, it, there is, you know, it is a frontier. There's not very much regulation uh, concerning these retreat centres. Some of them do pay a lot of attention to having the right clinical staff and settings and well-trained and experienced uh, sitters and guides. And yet some of them are, are a bit more cavalier and cowboy about their approach to it. Can you discuss sort of the level of regulation for scientific investigators like yourself in the UK and the US? If you wanted to have a clinical study uh, where you try it out on people and see what happens to investigate these profound life-changing experiences that have been reported, how hard is it to do that? Can, can you do it? It is feasible and you know, not very much has changed in the, in the way of regulation. To, to either prevent or en enable people to do this kind of research. I think the climate around the research has shifted. It's very expensive, it's, it's, it's quite arduous. You have to go jump through a lot of hurdles and hoops as, as it should be. Um, but the current legislation, particularly in the UK that I'm aware of, is not very conducive to doing this kind of research. It's very expensive. You need to get a home office license. Only a few centers 
are able to actually uh, administer and have these psychedelic agents. I mean, they're, they're treated in much the same way as nuclear grade, weapons grade nu uranium, right? So, uh, and, and it would help to advance the clinical research if, if the governments at least, you know, remove some of the restrictions around clinical research at the very least. Would you favor that? that that's a position that you, you would take? Yes, absolutely. I think it's really important. I mean, we're in, we're in the kind of greatest kind of scientific censorship that's occurred ever, probably in the in the history of science. Uh, in many respects, you know, these things were prohibited from from being researched for nearly fifty years, uh, and that, and that's very much kind of anti knowledge, anti science. I think. You know, one of the uses, uh, well, for a psychedelic psilocybin in particular, there's a great an increased interest in psilocybin. And it may be and a move toward legalization here in this country uh, for patients who are, are uh, terminal, uh, hospice patients who are take this substance and are able to sort of get their head around the idea of dying. Um, it seems like a profound benefit uh, under, uh, you know, under the correct circumstances. Um, do you see the research heading in that direction? And would DMT be appropriate or is that strictly for psilocybin? Well, DMT, interestingly, is like uh, the chemical cousin of psilocybin. Psilocybin is the fungi kingdom's version of DMT. We find DMT everywhere else in nature and psilocybin, which is very chem chemically, structurally similar, uh, we find in fungi alone. Uh, so they're very similar in, in many respects, although you know that there are slightly different experiences associated with them. So potentially DMT could be used for this kind of research as well. But the thing about psilocybin is it does give you these kind of extended four hour experiences. And in the research in, in uh, uh, palliative care with people who have end of life cancer and so on, they, they tend to have a mystical experience of some kind. Those people who have a mystical experience have much better clinical outcomes. And they, they come, to come, come to some kind of existential resolution where they, they don't quite fear death in the same way they did before. And consequently, that has fantastic knock-on effects onto people's psychological well-being by reducing their anxiety, reducing their depression, reducing the amount of medications they need, and making them better pre prepared and, and more ready for their own mortality. Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot and ask you if you've tried it. Uh, if you want to say that's fine, but have you been to ceremonies or procedures or even clinical trials where it's been administered? And if so, can you describe what you saw, what, what happened? So in my research, I, I'm, I'm fortunate in that I've been a participant in, in numerous neuroscientific research studies being injected with various psychedelics in the laboratory, in brain scanners, and have also conducted a lot of uh, anthropological field research uh, with indigenous tribes around the world, where oh, you're wow. often encouraged to partake. So I've experienced both ends of the spectrum. And, you know, these really are extraordinary experiences. Um, it, it, almost impossible to describe in many ways. We, we can name some of the, the features of the experience, you may see colorful geometric kaleidoscopic images, you may see a, a kind of fantastic visionary experiences. You may feel shifts in your bodily awareness. You may regress to childhood memories. There, there's so many experiences. Any dimension of your personal experience, your consciousness can change in a psychedelic experience in extremely profound ways, which although I can describe to you, doesn't necessarily prepare you for the experience in terms of that experience is gonna be unique to you uh, and, and so it helps to prepare people for these experiences, but at the end of the day, there was only so much the preparation can do in terms of what the experience is actually like. For so long, you, you've talked about the indigenous peoples who, who tried it. Um, shamans, this has been the realm of shamans for centuries, for, for maybe millennia. Uh, it was held to a small group to have this knowledge and they would share it uh, here and there. It, it's same thing with indigenous people in, in North America. Um, whether it's peyote or mescaline or things like that. Uh, I wonder if you have thought about uh, the idea of sharing it with the rest of the world as opposed to keeping it in the hands of shamans, whether it's a good idea. Well, I mean, traditionally, I mean, certainly the shamanic indigenous cultures I've worked with, their, their psychedelic use are, are kind of like the bedrock of their cultural cosmology, their identity. If you take, for example, the Boradica of, of Mexico, they're, they're known as the Huicholi, from the, from by outsiders. Uh, the peyote is at the core of all their mythology, their, their cultural uh, calendar, all of their activities. 
you know, it's not just like there's one shaman lives at the edge of the village and he does his, his, his kind of psychedelic shamanic stuff and he initiates people. The whole community are involved in it. Uh, you know, people, the whole community, everyone from small children to geriatrics go on the pilgrimage to go and collect the peyote. So it's embedded within their whole culture, their identity, their worldview, um, their heritage. And so it's, they, they don't really keep it to themselves. I mean, they've kept it to themselves as a culture until recently. Uh, but even now, these indigenous shamanic cultures are saying, look, you know, it's about time the rest of the world woke up to these things because I think there's a lot they can learn from it. And, you know, the world's going to hell in a breadbasket pretty quickly otherwise. So uh, I don't necessarily think these things were just contained within a, within a, within a significant few. Uh, I haven't read your full book, but the parts that I've read. It, the, what I got out of it is, hey, we're on the dawn of a new era of research into this, and that's a good thing because the world could benefit from this. Is that really what you want to get across from the the book? Yes, very much so. I mean, partly. I mean that 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 headline news is is kind of coming out already elsewhere. Uh, the book itself is is more of a, a deeper philosophical kind of exploration into the nature of reality, our nature of being. Uh, the, the nature of consciousness really. So it's, it's asking some really big questions about who we are, uh, but that, that message is embedded in it that yes, uh, psychedelics do have massive potential benefits, which we could utilize particularly now in, in our current state of ecological mental health crisis. Thanks very much, I appreciate it.